Well, thank you so much. This book that uh, published three days ago in the United States, Science Set Free, uh, is called The Science Delusion in England. And what science is being set free from, I hope, is the science delusion. And the science delusion is the belief that science already understands the nature of reality in principle, leaving only the details to be filled in. Um, that, I think, is a profoundly mistaken view. Most people react with incredulity at first to this proposition. What could be more successful than science? It's given us uh, cell phones, smartphones, computers, jet planes, uh, keyhole surgery. Uh, there's huge benefits uh, from the sciences and their technological applications. It looks as if nothing could be wrong with this. Yet, I think there's a, a great deal of mistaken thinking at the very heart of science and that there's a conflict within science which is actually constricting science from what it should be doing. Um, I see science as a method of inquiry, um, a means of exploring reality. But there's another side of science, which is science as a worldview or a dogmatic belief system. Now, most people, again, are incredulous when I suggest that science is a dogmatic belief system. Because they say, well, surely science is the one thing that enables us to go beyond dogmatic beliefs. It's the, the one thing that pays full attention to evidence and free inquiry and uh, open-minded thinking. That's an ideal of science, and it's an ideal that I share. But it's not one that's usually uh, put into practice. Within the sciences, there's a very strongly defined uh, set of beliefs which most scientists don't even realize are beliefs. They think other people have beliefs, Christians, Buddhists, Muslims, and so on, but, uh, but they don't have beliefs, they know the truth. And these beliefs are taken to be such established truths that they're not even discussed. When you study science, people don't say, these are the things you've got to believe, here's the creed. You absorb them as if by osmosis. Um, they're just things that are so taken for granted, you assume they must be true. And most people outside the scientific world assume they must be true because science is so successful and has such huge prestige as a result of it. What I do in this book, Science Set Free, is take the ten dogmas of modern science, the ten most important dogmas, and I turn them into questions, treating them as hypotheses that can be tested rather than... Uh, assumptions you can't challenge. The ten dogmas are as follows. First, the belief that the whole world is mechanical or machine-like. The universe is a machine, animals are machines, plants are machines, humans are machines, lumbering robots, in Richard Dawkins' evocative phrase. Um, so everything is basically mechanical. Machines differ from organisms in that organisms have their own self-organizing powers, they organize themselves. Plants grow by themselves, for example. Um, they also have their own purposes or goals. Machines don't. Machines are designed from outside, and they don't have their own purposes. They just do what humans want them to do. They serve our purposes. The difference is clear uh, if you compare trying to get somewhere in a car compared with riding there on a horse. If you get in the car, it'll go wherever you want it to go as long as it's in working order. If you get on a horse, it might easily have ideas of its own um, and not go where you want it to go because it's an organism. It's got its own goals. In the 17th century, uh, by taking away purposes, uh, uh, designs, uh, and so on from nature and taking them outside nature, putting them in a transcendent machine-making god, um, the founders of modern science thought they were strengthening the case for religion by weakening the autonomy of nature. Um, but they did so by enforcing on the sciences right from the very beginning this machine theory of nature, a mechanistic view. Now that's the first and the most central assumption. But it's not a proof to many places of decimals tested by experiment, it's just a metaphor. Um, you can't prove a metaphor. It's useful in certain respects, but not in others. And um, my view is that nature is much better thought of as organic, as the universe is like a developing organism. 
Well, that's the first assumption or dogma. The second is that matter is unconscious. Uh, the universe is made up of atoms, molecules, stars, galaxies, crystals, all of which are completely unconscious. Everything in nature is unconscious, except uh, human brains and uh, maybe the brains of a number of other higher animals. Or for the liberal materialists, maybe uh, going down as far as insects or worms. But nevertheless, uh, matter itself is intrinsically unconscious. Then there's the assumption that the laws of nature are fixed. The laws of nature are the same today as they were at the moment of the Big Bang, and they'll be the same forever. And as well as the laws being fixed, the constants are fixed. The fundamental constants, like the gravitational constant, the speed of light, and so on, ha have always been the same. The next assumption is that the total amount of matter and energy is always the same, the principle of conservation of matter and energy. Next, that nature is purposeless. Uh, the whole of nature is devoid of purpose, and the entire evolutionary process has no purpose or direction. Next, biological inheritance is material. Everything that organisms inherit is inherited materially, mainly as DNA, or now uh, there's uh, added complexity through epigenetic modifications of the DNA uh, or through cytoplasmic inheritance. But essentially, uh, most people treat the word hereditary as if it's syn synonymous with genetic. Uh, assumption number seven is that memories are stored as material traces inside the brain. Everything you remember is somehow encoded and stored inside your brain. Dogma eight, the mind is inside the head. Mental activity is brain activity. It's all inside your head. Uh, assumption nine, the dogma nine, follows from number eight. Psychic phenomena are illusory. Things like telepathy may appear to exist. Lots of people may believe they've had telepathic experiences, but that's because they're not smart enough to realize it's just coincidence or must have some other perfectly normal explanation. It's an illusion. And dogma 10, mechanistic medicine is the only kind that really works. Alternative and complementary therapies may appear to work, but that's because people would have got better anyway, or it's just the placebo effect. Um, uh, but mechanistic medicine is the only real kind of medicine, and that's why governments uh, almost exclusively fund research on mechanistic medicine and not on other kinds, and why uh, insurance companies and national health services uh, confine almost all their funding to mechanistic medicine because it's the only kind that really works. It's scientific medicine. Well, those are the ten beliefs which underlie the modern world view. Within science, some of them are questioned by some scientists in some areas of science, and as I hope to show uh, today and tomorrow, uh, all of them really have been superseded by advances in science itself. But nevertheless, these are the beliefs that most people pick up during the course of their scientific education, or indeed in the course of any kind of education, because almost all modern people have been brought up to have a respect for science and to believe it must be true. Um, so these are the default assumptions of most educated people. Now, when we turn them into questions, things look very different. First of all, within science, you're not meant to question them. If you question them, you break taboos. And there's all sorts of sanctions against breaking taboos. Um, I'm, I'm going, I don't have time this evening to go into all ten uh, delusions uh, um, but I'll, I'll just deal with two or three of them. Uh, tomorrow I shall speak in more detail about these in, in the workshop at CIIS. I'll start with the total amount of matter and energy is always the same. This very familiar assumption. The assumption is the total amount of matter and energy has always been the same since the moment of the Big Bang when all the matter and energy in the universe suddenly appeared. As my friend Terence McKenna used to say, modern science is based on the principle, give us one free miracle and we'll explain the rest. <laughs> and, and, and the one free miracle is the appearance of all the matter and energy in the universe and all the laws that govern it from nothing in a single instant. Uh, as Terence used to say, that's the limit case of credulity. If you can swallow that, you can swallow anything. Um, so... Um, 
the uh, normal belief is that the total amount of matter and energy is always the same. This is the assumption that I myself uh, questioned last. I only really questioned it two or three years ago. I'd questioned all the others during the course of my scientific career, but not that one. I thought this is the one that's most certain, uh, that's uh, most unquestionable. And it's the one that I believed longest, because I learned it in high school. It, uh, it, it was something I learned in elementary physics lessons. I thought, though, I should include it in this book, because it's certainly one of the powerful assumptions of science, uh, one of the most venerable assumptions. Um, and I also thought it would be good to find at least one of the dogmas of science was true. I didn't want to seem one-sided by finding all ten uh, were false. Um, I, I hoped that this one would turn out to be true. I had nothing against it to start with. Um, but the more I looked into it, the more dodgy it seemed, until I now see it as a house of cards built on foundations of sand to combine metaphors. Um, first of all, what's the history? Is this something people have established by detailed experiments measuring things with incredible accuracy to many places of decimals? No. Uh, this, uh, this dogma is based on philosophical and theological assumptions that have been around for centuries, even millennia. In ancient Greece, the philosophers of ancient Greece uh, were trying to find different ways of conceiving of reality. And for them, the ultimate reality was eternal and essentially changeless. The Pythagoreans thought that ultimate reality was numbers and mathematics, proportions and ratios. The Platonists thought that the ultimate reality was the realm of eternal ideas or forms beyond space and time. And the materialists, um, the founders of modern materialism, the, or also known as the atomists, uh, said, no, the ultimate reality was matter. Matter was made up of lots of little bits, atoms, which couldn't be split up by definition. Uh, they couldn't increase in number or decrease in number. The total number was always the same. Therefore, implicitly, the total amount of matter is always the same. It's a philosophical assumption. And when atomism was reincorporated into science in the 17th century, this assumption was carried over. God made all the atoms in the first place at the creation of the world, and being God-made and God-given, the total number remains the same forever. God also imposed motion on the world machine when he started it off, and because the motion or energy in the universe is God-given, that too is fixed in amount and can't possibly decay or uh, wear away, because it's basically a divine principle in, it put into nature at the beginning. That's the basis of these assumptions. They were codified in the 19th century, uh, in the 1850s, in fact, in the laws of thermodynamics and in the principle of conservation of matter and energy, and appear to be certain truths. But while most of us may pay a great deal of reverence to these principles, physicists themselves have felt less bound by them. In the 1980s, it became clear that galaxies were attracting each other much more than they ought to. If you add up all the matter in the stars, make a generous allowance for black holes and planets and gas clouds, uh, uh, if you think all the mass they, they might have, uh, and they were attracting other galaxies much more than they should uh, by gravitation if you add up all that matter. It also turned out that stars within galaxies were being attracted much more than they should have been, according to the amount of matter in the galaxies. So something was wrong with uh, this uh, model. So how could physicists fix it? Well, simple. They could increase the amount of gravity by just adding in more matter to their equations, they add in exactly the right amount to make the equations balance. And uh, what is this matter they've added in? Well, it's dark matter. We don't know what it is, but we know it must be there because it makes the equations balance. <laughs> to this day, nobody knows what dark matter is. Its nature is literally obscure. Um, and there's five times more of it than there is of regular matter. Now, is dark matter conserved? Is the total amount always the same? Can it be converted to regular matter? So could regular matter just appear from nowhere or disappear into dark matter? Nobody knows, because nobody knows what dark matter is, how it works, or what it does. 
But this caused a new problem, because suddenly there's all this extra matter in the universe, which meant the whole universe was more massive than anyone had previously supposed. And now what about the expansion of the universe? The universe is expanding, but it's also being pulled back by gravitation, the gravitation of everything within the universe. So now there's a lot more matter in the universe. It ought to be causing the universe to slow down in its expansion and finally stop expanding and then begin to contract. In the 1990s, that's what most cosmologists thought, that the universe was going to slow down, then contract, until it all ended in tears, in the reverse of the Big Bang, known in the trade as the Big Crunch. <laughs> um, uh, everything would finally implode into a black hole. But around 1998, it turned out that, uh, from observation of distant galaxies, that far from slowing down, uh, the expansion of the universe was speeding up things were expanding faster and faster. Now, how could you explain that? There was nothing in physics that could explain that, and yet it seems to be happening. So, simple. Uh, they found a way of explaining that. Uh, there must be a new kind of energy in the universe that's pushing everything apart, dark energy. And um, just add in the right amount that you need to make the equations balance and fit the observations, and you fix the problem. But it causes yet another problem for physics because it turns out the amount of dark energy is increasing. As the universe expands, you get more dark energy. The universe is now a perpetual motion machine. The total amount of dark matter and dark energy vary from time to time as physicists titrate the amounts to make their equations balance. But roughly speaking, today, the current estimate is that just over 96% of the universe consists of dark matter and dark energy. Less than 4% consists of the kind of matter and energy you learned about at school and to which these laws of conservation of matter and energy are supposed to apply. What if dark energy can be converted into regular energy? What if regular energy can be converted into dark energy? Is that possible? Nobody knows. This room is full of dark matter and dark energy. We've no idea how they might be interacting with processes going on in our physical world. Meanwhile, um, <laughs> in quantum theory, uh, an essential part of it is the idea that there's the quantum vacuum field or the zero-point field um, on which the regular forms of matter and energy are just like waves on the ocean, that the world is filled with uh, another kind of energy, the zero-point energy or quantum vacuum field energy. The quantum vacuum is not a vacuum, it's a plenum. It's full of energy. Now, what does that do? It certainly makes the equations of quantum physics work because they can bring in virtual photons and virtual particles from the quantum vacuum field and then magic them away again uh, to make the whole thing work mathematically. Um, but what if we could tap it? Could we tap any of these mysterious forms of energy in the universe? Well, the usual assumption is, of course not, because the conservation of matter and energy forbids all these kinds of perpetual motion machine ideas. But the world is full of inventors working in garages and sheds who claim to have above unity devices, free energy devices. Go on the online and search for above unity devices and you'll find a vast array of claims out there. Uh, some of these get financed up to a certain point. Uh, they make these devices, they demonstrate them. I've seen one of them in England. A friend of mine is in a company uh, that uh, has developed one of these devices it does indeed seem to give out twice as much energy as you put in. Um, it's been tested in a couple of universities who've written reports, couldn't find anything wrong with it, uh, but didn't want their uh, reports to be published because it would discredit their university and their physics department because this is such a taboo area. Um, so do any of these devices work? If they did, they could provide boundless amounts of energy that would completely transform the world economy and uh, ecology and change the way we think about the future. Do they work or don't they? Nobody knows because there's no scientific tests done of these in the official world because they're completely taboo. They defy this dogma. Because they defy this dogma, they're kept in this, the fringe areas of science. They're in the realm of parascience or fringe science. Uh, where all sorts of extraordinary claims are made, many of them perhaps quite absurd. What could we do about it? Well, nothing if we stick with business as usual in science. 
If we don't, though, if we take the view that perhaps some of these forms of energy really exist and can be tapped, take seriously what science is actually telling us, um, how would you find out? Well, my suggestion is a competition, a million-dollar prize, uh, the best above unity device would win the prize. Uh, people could submit their various claims, their devices, have them tested by engineers and physicists who would not be trying to debunk them, but be given an honest appraisal of whether this is working as it seems to. Some have already been tested and do seem to work as their claim to. If anyone wins this prize, I think it would change the climate because people would then invest in these things and things would happen right now. They have small investors, but as soon as they go to the big investors, like the big energy companies, um, they then call up their physics advisors, and you know, within five minutes, the guy will say, you know, these people are claiming it's above unity. That's impossible. This is just another perpetual motion machine crank. Forget it. You know, so the prejudice is so great that it's very hard for them to get investment. If anyone won this prize, I think the climate would completely change. And if nobody won it, because if none of them really work, the conventional people would have the, the sweet delight of saying, I told you so. But for the first time, we'd have experimental evidence there right, instead of just an assumption and a, a whole blanket denial of alternative possibilities. It turns out that the principle of conservation of matter and energy when applied to living organisms is equally dodgy. And this was one of the most shocking discoveries for me. I'm a biologist, and I'd always taken for granted that living organisms follow the law of conservation of matter and energy. When I looked into the history, I found that uh, it wasn't at all clear what was going on. In the early 19th century, particularly in Germany, many biologists thought that living organisms had a, a, a another kind of energy over and above the regular kinds, called, they called it vital energy or life force. Um, in the 1850s, Hermann von Helmholtz, better known as a physicist, uh, made it his uh, mission to prove that living organisms were nothing but machines. He was a doctor in the Prussian army and uh, a medical student when he formed this desire to refute vitalism, the doctrine that there was something special about living organisms. He tried to prove it by doing experiments with frogs' legs, making them twitch by electrical stimulation and measuring the heat given out to try and show they followed normal laws of heat and work. He couldn't get any accurate results, so he gave up an empirical test and stuck to a theoretical argument Living organisms are machines, therefore they obey the normal laws of physics and chemistry and conservation of matter and energy, um, therefore living organisms are machines. It was a circular argument. He assumed what he set out to prove, and after that it was taken as a certain fact in biology. It wasn't until 1899 that anyone tried to uh, test this experimentally with human beings, and there was a, one test with a dog before that. In the United States, Atwater and Benedict, who were two of the founders of nutrition science in America, uh, had people in calorimeters, insulated boxes. They'd live in them for several weeks. All the gases going in and out were measured, the urine, the feces, the food, the energy, and, and so on. Uh, and they did this to establish, or as they put it, demonstrate that organisms, living humans, were nothing but machines obeying the regular laws of physics. Their first results turned out to be wrong, so they simply changed the correction values for the nutritive values of the foods uh, so they could get the right answer. But, um, and they, they came up with a result in agreement with the theory uh, to an accuracy of 99.9%. .9%. Everyone heaved a sigh of relief. This was now proved. It was the foundation of nutrition science. It was a firm foundation for biology. People wrote articles saying it was the last nail in the coffin of vitalism and so forth. It wasn't until the 1970s that this work was re-examined by an American nutritionist called Paul Webb, working in the Midwest. He redid their experiments and found huge discrepancies. He found that people who were obese and doing very little exercise put out about 25% less energy than they ought to have done, whereas people who were not eating and doing a lot of exercise somehow had excess to 25% more energy than they should have done. He then looked back at the classical results of Atwater and Benedict, 
they'd found similar discrepancies, but they'd carefully got uh, uh, the right number of people below the average uh, and the right number above the average, so they cancelled out to give this perfect expected result. When Webb published his results showing these massive discrepancies, instead of it causing uh, consternation in the world of nutrition science, it was just ignored. Everyone knew Webb must be wrong. He must have just got the figures wrong or done his sums wrong because everyone knew the truth already, that living organisms, including humans, obey the normal laws. When people in other cultures, like Hindus, talk of prana or uh, Chinese or Japanese talk of chi or ki energy, this is treated as purely metaphorical. It can't be real because we know that uh, living organisms obey the normal laws of ordinary energy. But nutrition science is full of anomalies. All over the world, uh, in India, in medieval Europe, in China, there are people who claim in the United States to be able to live without food. These breatharians, as they're now called, uh, have a long ancestry in many parts of the world. Um, some have been tested and found to be fraudulent. Some have been tested by scientists over the centuries, including quite recently in India, um, and found uh, to be mysteriously able to live uh, in apparent defiance of the normal laws of energy. Now, the normal assumption is these people are complete frauds. Anyone who investigates them must be a flaky scientist. Any results that don't debunk these people must be fraudulent or flawed, and the issue is closed. But what if it isn't closed? If I were a nutrition scientist, this would seem to me one of the most interesting questions that we could possibly ask. Is there some other form of energy? The one certain finding in nutrition science in the last 20 years is the inf important effects of caloric restriction. Organisms that have fed uh, half the normal calories, generally speaking, live uh, much longer than those who get the normal diet. And this applies to people, mice, yeast. Uh, all sorts of organisms seem to follow this principle. Something may be going on uh, with drawing in forms of energy, maybe from the quantum vacuum field, uh, th that mean that the standard assumptions of nutrition science are simply false. And it's not as if nutrition science is the most brilliantly successful of all modern sciences. A billion people in the world are obese and no one seems to know what dietary systems work best and if they do work well, why they don't work for very long. Um, this is not one of science's greatest triumphs, this area of inquiry. It also has an, a bearing on medicine because many medical systems from other cultures are based on forms of energy ours isn't. Well, that's one set of assumptions. The total amount of matter and energy is always the same, the dogmatic assumption. When you look at it, as you see in both in physics and biology, the picture that emerges is not one of total certainty and 100% success. It's one of dogmatic beliefs and uh, extraordinary anomalies, including 96% of the universe not being regular matter and energy, um, and discrepant experimental results. Now, if we look at some of these other assumptions, we find similar anomalies. Take the idea that the laws and constants of nature are fixed. Now, this is something I've been challenging for a long time. The idea of morphic resonance, which gives a kind of memory in nature, uh, suggests that the so-called laws of nature are more like habits. Um, that's the basis of my thesis of morphic resonance, and some of you have read about it in my books, A New Science of Life and the Presence of the Past. And I'm not going to speak about that now because I'm not here particularly to push my own theories, um, uh, but to open up the much bigger question in science. So instead of looking at the laws of nature, I'll look at the constants. This is something where I've done uh, very little work of my own, um, except for reviewing the existing literature. Now, are the constants fixed? Is the gravitational constant or the speed of light, for example, completely fixed? Well, you might assume they must be. Surely uh, this is something that's well known. But if you look at the data, a very different picture emerges. I started by going back through handbooks of physics where they give the constants. And if you go back through previous editions, you find the constants actually are quite different as you move back through these editions of handbooks of physics. And in doing this, I discovered that the speed of light dropped 
by 20 kilometers per second between 1928 and 1945 all over the world. Um, and then it went up again to somewhere near its pre-1928 value. And the values that people found in labs all, ar all around the world were very accurate ones according to their own data. They had very small error bars. Um, they, they, they were up there with the tiny error bars, then they went down here with tiny error bars, then they went up there. It wasn't as if there was a huge spread of error that en encompassed this 20 kilometers per second drop. No, something else seemed to be happening. I went to talk about this to the head of the metrology section. Metrology is the science which measures the constants at the British National Physical Laboratory, Dr. Brian Petley. He was kind enough to see me and to discuss it with me. And so I said to him, now what do you make of this drop in the speed of light between 1928 and 1945? And then it went up again. He said, oh dear, he said, you've, uh, you've uncovered one of the most embarrassing episodes in the history of our science. <laughs> and, and, and I said, well, it needn't be embarrassing. I said, what if the speed of light really dropped? Um, wouldn't that tell us something really exciting and interesting about the universe? He said, well, it couldn't have really dropped. And I said, why not? He said, because it's a constant. <laughs> and so then I said, well, well, then how do you explain this discrepancy, this drop, with people getting these small errors? I said, the only thing I can think of is that people, suddenly the fashion changed and people started adjusting their results, fudging them to get what they thought was the expected value. He said, oh, we don't like to use the word fudging. And I said, well, what word do you prefer? And he said, we prefer to call it intellectual phase locking. And, uh, so I said, you mean that all around the world, people intellectually phase locked on this new value, discarded discrepant values, corrected them till they got that right value, and, and, and then published values that agreed with what they thought everyone else was getting. He said, well, more or less. And I said, well, then when it went up again, um, then the same thing happened. He said, yes, more or less. I said, well, could it happen again? He said, no, thank goodness it can't happen anymore. <laughs> and I said, why not? He said, we fixed the speed of light by definition in 1972. And I said, you mean you've just defined it by a kind of fiat? And he said, yes. And, um, and I said, but what if it really changes? He said, we'd never know. We've redefined the meter in terms of the speed of light. So the units it's measured in would change along with the speed of light if it did change. So that's the state of play in the most fundamental of all constants in modern physics. With the most ancient of constants in physics, Newton's universal gravitational constant, big G, as it's known in the trade, um, it's written with a capital G. Um, the, the values of big G have been fluctuating wildly. Um, even in the last 10 years, it's varied by more than 1.3%. Most people assume these things go accurate to many places of decimals, but not so. Um, big G uh, varies embarrassingly. Um, and how they actually fix the value of G is they get different labs around the world measure it. They take an average of their measurements, discarding ones that seem to be too far off on the grounds they must be errors. Then the different labs submit them to the International Committee on Metrology. They then discard any values from labs where they think the lab must have got it wrong because it doesn't agree with the others, average the remaining ones and come up with what's called the best value of G. Uh, when I left Dr. Petley's office, he said, oh, by the way, you might like to see this. Uh, he said, it's just come from the press. And he went, leant down beneath his desk. There was a cardboard box full of pamphlets. He pulled one out and gave it to me. He said, the latest values of the physical constants. Um, so... Uh, um, so, in some scientists, well, some philosophers, and, and uh, Alfred North Whitehead, for example, who was a mathematician as well as a philosopher, um, had a theory of relativity that differed from Einstein's. And his differed in that it predicted that value, the measurements of big G would vary from time to time as measured on Earth. And so there's a, there is a reason for thinking they might vary. Uh, they might also vary if there really is dark matter and if it's in clouds of uneven density, if the Earth passes through them in its orbit around the Sun, um, or if the Earth in different parts of its orbit is um, affected differently by dark matter out there in the galaxy, it could affect these measurements. So the question is, 
do these uh, measurements vary similarly all around the world? Um, in 1994, in my book, Seven Experiments That Could Change the World, I tried to encourage uh, metrologists to look at the raw data and see, are they all, all the values of G all up, uh, say, in June and down in July or down in December? Do they vary together? Is there a cyclical variation in these around the world? They refused to do it because they said, G is constant, this is a meaningless question. But the data are there, it wouldn't cost very much to do this. It's terribly frustrating that it hasn't been done. I think if it was done, we might find uh, meaningful variations in G which could actually be analysed and give rise to new science. Now, this isn't a terribly fundamental thing, it's a fundamental constant, but we're talking something fairly simple to do here. A graduate student could probably do this analysis. Um, it might turn out, in fact, that the constants, they all vary as measured. Uh, the usual assumption is these variations are all errors. It might turn out that they vary within limits rather chaotically. Uh, the day may come when uh, we open scientific journals like Nature every week, uh, and there might be a page like the stock market reports you know, on the constants. So this week, G held constant. C was up a little bit. The fine structure constant was down. Uh, there's been a fall in the charge on the electron. And, uh, uh, it might be that uh, there's a quality of time, uh, perhaps a little like that that astrologers think in terms of, uh, but which uh, might, because of different balances in, in the strength of the different constants. It would mean different things could happen at different times. All these things are possible, but we'll never find out if we have the dogmatic assumption they're constant and all the variations are ironed out uh, and the old values are simply discarded and they, we always go with the latest best value. So there's the assumption that the constants of nature are fixed. It's nothing but an assumption some physicists have proposed they might actually vary over time. It has actually been discussed a little bit by Whitehead and by Paul Dirac and a few other physicists. But for the most part, this is, question is not entertained uh, within science. But there's no reason it shouldn't be. And it's not as if science as we know it will collapse. It will just get more interesting and we might find out something really new. Now, I'll take another of these assumptions now, um, that memories are stored inside the brain. Now, this is something that not just scientists take for granted, but most people take for granted. If you uh, just ask the average person you meet on the street, where are memories? They'd say, oh, in your head. It's just a standard assumption of our whole culture. It's where a scientific assumption has spread through the whole culture and is taken for granted. Now, where's the evidence? that memories are in our head. Well, many people would say you don't need any evidence. It's obvious they've got to be there. Where else could they be? Some people say, well, you might have tissue memory, muscle memory, etc. But it's still uh, physically located in the body. It's got to be there. How else could it possibly work? This is an assumption. There are actually alternatives. And the idea that memories are stored in the brain has been questioned by philosophers for centuries. Plotinus in his theory of the soul, thought that memories were an aspect of the soul, not of the body, and were not stored in the brain. Henri Bergson, the great uh, French philosopher, in his book Matter and Memory, uh, pro provided a persuasive argument that memories are not stored in the brain. There's another kind of causation, a causation across time, which can carry memories across time without them being stored in brains. Bertrand Russell, the uh, British philosopher, uh, uh, agreed with Bergson, and he proposed uh, that there was a new kind of causation that he called monemic causation, uh, a kind of causation that works uh, is the basis of memory, uh, that leaps across time, uh, connecting similar things across time. Ludwig Wittgenstein uh, came to the conclusion that memory was not stored in the brain. He was one of the most influential philosophers in the English-speaking world in the 20th century. Um, uh, my own view is that uh, memory depends on morphic resonance. Morphic resonance is a kind of resonance across time from uh, similar patterns of activity in the past to similar patterns in the present. Um, that's the postulate of the theory. It's a resonance theory of memory. And what the resonance theory of memory would say is that memory depends on a kind of resonance with the past. When you meet somebody you haven't seen for a while and you recognize them, you resonate with yourself in the past, the last time you saw them. 
And there's a resonance across time uh, that gives you that feeling of recognition. You know you've seen them before. It's not, in the meantime, stored inside your brain. There isn't a kind of copy of their face somewhere embedded in your nervous system. Um, that memory may depend on the resonance process, not on physical storage inside the brain. Well, what about the evidence? For a hundred years, people have been trying to find the putative memory traces inside brains. In the 1950s, there was a determined attempt to find these by Carl Lashley here in the United States, who trained rats and monkeys to learn a wide variety of tricks. Once they'd learned the trick, he cut out bits of their brain to find out where the memories were stored. And to his surprise, he found that he could cut out large amounts of the brain. It didn't matter which amount, right, left, front, back, upper, lower. He could cut out large chunks of the brain uh, without destroying the memory. Of course, if you remove the whole brain, the animal couldn't behave anymore, so you couldn't uh, detect what was going on in terms of memory. But you could cut out large amounts of the brain, and these animals, after they recovered from the operation, could still remember. He came to the conclusion that memory seemed to be both everywhere and nowhere in particular. It couldn't be localized. His student, Carl Pribram, uh, took this idea further with his idea of the holographic storage of memories, that they're stored like a hologram over large regions of the brain. Since then, there have been further determined efforts to find memories, either in modified nerve endings, in phosphorylated proteins, or in other molecular mechanisms. Over and over again, they've drawn a blank. We know that when memories are laid down, there's activity in certain regions of the brain, particularly the hippocampus, and when the uh, memories are retrieved, there's activity in the brain that can be detected by brain scans. But in between, they just seem to disappear. Now, does this make people think, are they really there? No. They just say, we haven't found out where they are yet. We need a few billion more dollars, and we'll have another determined attempt to find them. But you see, there may be a very simple reason for this repeated failure. After billions and billions and billions of dollars have been spent, millions of man-hours expended on this quest. Uh, um, the, the, the reason uh, that they can't find them may be very simple. They may not be there. It may be rather like coming to your house and trying to find what programs you watched last night on television. Did you watch Obama's acceptance speech? Can I find out by analyzing the transistors and wires in your TV set? No, I can't, uh, because it doesn't leave a trace in the TV set. That's not how TV works. It tunes in. It doesn't store. It's not a video recorder. It's, it's a receiver. I think our brains are much more like receivers than recording devices. And, of course, if you damage a receiver, you can damage the ability to retrieve memory. If I came and damaged the sound circuit of your TV set, I could make your TV set aphasic. It could, wouldn't speak. Um, but that wouldn't prove that all the sounds that come out of the TV set are originating inside that bit of the TV set or that they're stored there. Similarly, brain damage through injury, stroke, or degenerative diseases like Alzheimer's doesn't prove, uh, if the memory is lost, that the memory is stored in the damaged or uh, uh, decaying tissue. It merely shows that this is affecting the ability to retrieve the memory. So it turns out that memory storage in the brain uh, is uh, an extremely open question. The evidence actually favors a resonance theory because of the failure of repeated uh, uh, attempts to find traces uh, in brains. The reason, uh, it also explains a lot more. Um, morphic resonance depends on similarity. We're all similar to lots of people in the past, especially members of our own family. And it would explain what Jung called the collective unconscious, a collective memory on which we all draw. But the reason we have our own memories is because we're more similar to ourselves in the past than we are to anyone else. If I ask you who's most similar to you in the past, the answer has to be you. You're more similar to yourself 10 years ago, 20 years ago, a day ago, uh, than you are to anyone else. And that's why you have your own memories and not other people's. From this point of view, individual memory and collective memory are different in degree, not in kind. Whereas the conventional theory would say collective memory doesn't really exist or it's just a cultural inheritance that is not at all what Jung was saying. It's, uh, um, uh, and individual memory is stored somewhere in the brain in as yet unidentified brain traces. So I think the resonance theory explains the fact better. 
So this is an open question. I'm not saying I'm definitely right about this, and so is Bergson, and Bertrand Russell and Ludwig Wittgenstein and Plotinus. Uh, I'm saying that there's a long tradition of thought of looking at memory in a different way, and the evidence favours this alternative way as opposed to the trace theory. And yet, 100% of research on memory paid for by NIH and other funding bodies uh, to the tune of billions of dollars a year is based on the unquestioned assumption it's got to be in the brain. There's no other alternative uh, that you can discuss within that framework of thought. Any discussion it's not in the brain is taboo. Then we come to the assumption that the mind is in the brain, the mind is the brain. Mental activity is brain activity. Uh, this says that everything you experience is somehow inside your head. Um, but is it? Uh, we've all been brought up with that assumption. Um, it's something that ordinary people, even in ordinary conversation, say. If they say it's in my mind, they often say it's in my head. Um, it's a, a, an assumption that runs through our entire civilization and which we're now busy spreading to the rest of the world through modern scientific education. Um, so, is it true? Well, I think if you think about vision just as a starting point, it's fairly easy to see that when you think about it, it just collapses as an assumption. Think of what happens during vision, e.g. you seeing me now. We all know the scientific explanation. Lights reflected from me travels through the electromagnetic field, enters your eyes, inverted images on your retinas, changes in the cone cells, impulses up the optic nerve, and activity in different regions of the brain, the optical cortex and elsewhere. So far, so good. We know more details about that than anyone's ever known before. But is that an explanation of vision? No, it's just a description of the changes that happen in your nervous system and in your eyes. How does that explain the conscious experience of seeing? Well, the answer to that is it doesn't. That none of this explains consciousness at all, which is why the mere existence of consciousness is called the hard problem by philosophers of mind. Um, so then, what might be going on? Well, where are these images located? The usual assumption is that your nervous system mysteriously generates a virtual reality display in full color and 3D inside your head, and that's what you're experiencing. Well, that's quite a stretch. No one's ever seen a virtual reality display inside a head. Uh, but let's just stay with the, this conventional view for a while. That means that when you see me standing here now, uh, your image of me isn't located where it seems to be, it's inside your head. There's a little Rupert somewhere inside your head. Um, and if you look at the sky, uh, uh, then the sky you're seeing is inside your head too. Your image of the sky is inside your brain. Uh, there was a, t a, a seminal paper on this subject published in a leading journal recently called Is Your Skull Beyond the Sky? And the author of the paper concluded, yes, of course it must be, because everything you experience is inside your brain. So your skull is beyond the sky. Everything you experience is inside your head. The head you seem to uh, experience that seems to be there is just a visual illusion produced as part of the virtual reality display, because the real skull is outside your whole realm of experience. That, believe it or not, is the official view taken to its logical extreme. The view I'm putting forward, by contrast, is so simple that it's hard to grasp. I'm suggesting your image of me is located right here. It's in your mind, but not inside your brain. Vision involves an inward movement of light and an outward projection of images. That the, everything you see in the world around you is projected out. Your mind extends far beyond your brain. If you look at a distant star, it extends out of literally over astronomical distances. So um, the projection of the mind in every act of perception is something that's not confined to humans. I think that's the way all image-forming eyes work. The world is full of invisible visual projections of other people, of animals, of birds, of insects. Uh, just as this room is full of invisible electromagnetic radiations carrying cell phone messages, TV, and radio programs, 
So when you go outdoors on a nice bright day, like today was in San Francisco, um, uh, the, the world is filled with these visual projections from all these creatures that are seeing the world, not just humans. Now, this is not a new theory of vision, and I claim no originality for it. It's what Plato taught, it's what the ancient Greeks believed, it's what Euclid uh, had as his basis of his optical theory of vision. Um, it's the way in which he explained mirror images. The reason you see things behind a mirror, the virtual images, is because when you project out uh, your image, being mental projections, they're not bent by the glass, they go straight through it, and you create these images behind the mirror. That's still the theory in physics textbooks today. It's basically based on the idea of an outward projection of images. Um, most children under the age of 10 believe that the eye projects out images. Jean Piaget, the developmental psychologist, uh, found that under the age of 10, most European children believe that vision involves an outward projection as well as an inward movement of light. However, Piaget said, rather pleased with himself, that by the age of 10 or 11, the average child learns the correct view, which is that thoughts and images are invisible things located inside the head. Now, most of us have taken that on trust, but no one's ever seen a thought or an image inside a head. Uh, all they've seen is electrical changes in brain activity. Um, so, is this just a philosophical question, or can it be tested? Now, as some of you already know, uh, this is something I've devoted some time to, because if your mind reaches out to touch what you're looking at, you should be able to affect what you're looking at just by looking at it. If it's another person, if you look at them from behind, through a window, they can't hear you, they can't smell you, they can't see you, they don't know you're there by any other means, uh, can they feel your gaze? Well, as soon as you ask that, you realize this is a common experience. Most people have had the feeling of being stared at, um, and have felt when people are looking at them from behind. Um, I've done lots of experiments. Uh, exp some of these experiments are so simple a child can do them, and in fact thousands of children already have done them. Uh, they've been done in primary schools and secondary schools in Britain, Germany, and throughout the state of Connecticut. Um, the <laughs> and these experiments uh, have given consistent, repeatable results. People can tell above chance when they're being stared at. This experiment's also been running in the Amsterdam Science Museum, the NEMO Center, for 15 years now. Tens of thousands of people have taken part. It's one of the biggest experiments ever done. The results are overwhelmingly positive and statistically significant. The sense of being stared at seems to be real. Yet regular science can't explain it at all, and it's treated as a completely taboo or paranormal topic uh, outside the remit of conventional science. It's not mentioned in regular psychology courses except dismissed as a superstition or an illusion that the uneducated are prone to believe in because they haven't learned a proper scientific theory of vision. Yet ordinary people may be completely right about this. I think it's a very fundamental ability. Most animals have it too. Uh, I think it probably evolved a very long time ago in the context of predator-prey relationships. A prey animal that could tell when a hidden predator was looking at it would tend to escape better than one that couldn't. And so I think this is very fundamental, very basic. It's found all over the world. Over 90% of people have experienced it. Uh, and it fits with a theory of vision that doesn't confine it all to the inside of the head. Um, for that reason, it's completely taboo uh, within science. And yet, it seems to happen. It's not expensive to do this research, and it's, in fact, very interesting. So I think the idea that the mind is confined to the brain, uh, this is one line of argument uh, that I think is persuasive in showing that the mind isn't confined to the inside of the head, the same theory is taken to mean that all our sensations of our body are in our brain. If I feel a pain in my toe, the pain isn't in my toe, it's in my brain. Uh, and it's referred to my toe in a rather unexplained way. What I'm saying is that just as my image of you is where it seems to be, namely outside me and where you're sitting, if I feel a pain in my toe, that pain is in the toe. It's not inside my brain. The brain may play a part, it does play a part in the sensation of pain and registering it, but the sensation is not in the, in the brain. Um, so I don't think our body image or our images of the external world are all in our brain. 
I think brains are grossly overrated, uh, just as genes are grossly overrated, uh, because people have tried to cram everything into brains, all perceptions, all thoughts, all sensations, all, all visual uh, uh, perception, uh, all memory, has been crammed into the brain. But the brain just doesn't do that. It's not what it's doing. It's working in some quite different way. Just as people have tried to cram all hereditary information into the genes, I think a lot of it's conveyed by morphic resonance. I'll talk more about that tomorrow in relation to biological inheritance. Well, I think this is enough to show that I've, I've only dealt with uh, three of the dogmas this evening and only with part of them at that. Uh, but this just gives you a flavour. And when you look at these dogmas in a critical scientific way, um, it turns out that they're, as hypotheses, they're not supported by the evidence. Better hypotheses are possible. This doesn't mean that the whole of science collapses and Western civilization uh, falls into ruins. It means science gets more exciting, more interesting, and we can ask new questions. It'll be more fun. And um, how might science move forward? Well, there are two ways I think that are really important. Um, I think the first is something that we can all play a part in. The world of pro professional science is full of people who've had psychic experiences, who have religious beliefs and practices, spiritual practices, uh, who go to alternative practitioners and so forth. Um, they're not all scientific fundamentalists and true believing materialists. Such people exist, and Richard Dawkins has done us all a good fav a favor by crystallizing those views and making them fully explicit. Um, this is certainly a point of view. Many scientists um, are actually not paid-up materialists who feel a deep need to believe in this worldview. They go along with it in public because not to do so would damage their career. It's a bit like communism in Russia under Brezhnev. How many people actually believed in the theories of communism? Uh, in public, many of them gave lip service to them. When party leaders made speeches, tens of thousands of people were clapping uh, in unison in these huge halls of the people. But did that mean they really believed it? No. Uh, when communism collapsed, how many were true believers in communism? A few. There were certainly some. But it wasn't a majority. And I think that's true in science today. Another factor that's important here is that the demographics of science are changing dramatically. Last year, two and a half million people in India graduated with science and engineering degrees. One and a half million in China, half a million in the US, 100,000 in Britain. And of those who, are in, at the graduate level in the US and in Britain, of those people, a third were Asian. They were Indian, Chinese and Korean. The majority of young scientists today are not from uh, white, European uh, and American backgrounds. They're Asian, and they have no reason to believe in this inherited baggage of the materialist worldview which has come to us through the European history of science for a variety of reasons. Um, uh, they have no reason to buy into that at all. They do so at work or pretend to do so because they know it would damage their career not to. I think one of the things that would change science most is if scientists felt the ability to come out to their colleagues and talk about what they really experience and what, re uh, what they're really interested in. This occurred to me most forcefully when I gave a seminar in Cambridge uh, on some of my work on dogs that know when their owners are coming home. Um, there were six scientists in this s small seminar and uh, they were all interested in the results. They talked about it politely. They were very non-committal in the official question period. They asked about the statistics, the methodology, and so on. But afterwards, one by one, they came up and uh, they said to me, you know, I've always been interested in this kind of thing. It's one reason I went into this in the first place. And another would come up, look around during the tea break. No one, if no one was listening, he said, you know, I've got a dog that does this right now. You know, when I go home from the lab, it's waiting for me at the door. Uh, when all six had told me they thought this was happening, and when all six had said the same thing to me, but I can't talk about it to my colleagues because they're all so straight, uh, I said to them, why don't you guys come out? You'd have so much more fun. Um, 
And I think this is the way forward within the sciences. I think there's so many people there who have spiritual interests, uh, psychic experiences and so forth, that don't or can't talk about them to their colleagues. If they do so, uh, they'll find that many of their colleagues share these interests. And the, the conversation in the laboratory tea room uh, would become so much more interesting uh, than it is at present. And these kinds of bigger questions I'm talking about would become part of the scientific debate rather than being marginalized and kept in taboo uh, areas where if scientists talk about them at all, they do it with their colleagues after a few glasses of wine with trusted friends in the evenings. I know that the scientific world is full of people who don't believe this because since I've been out for decades, um, scientists feel quite free to talk to me. Uh, and since my book, The Science Delusion, came out in Britain, I've been receiving emails from eminent British scientists in different branches of science and medicine uh, telling me about their views and some of them asking to meet me to discuss this. I've been having a series of clandestine meetings uh, <laughs> with eminent scientists. Um, and for good reasons, they, they explain to me why they can't let their colleagues know what their true views are. Uh, and for one or two, the price is very heavy. They'll lose their grants, they won't get their papers published in high citation peer review journals, they won't get tenure or promotion. Uh, there's a big price to pay for breaking these taboos. But if enough people do it, it would be like gays and the gay liberation movement. Uh, it would be empowering, mutually empowering. And it would just make science so much more fun and much more attractive to young people. Right now, it really puts off a lot of bright young people because they see it as a, just a load of dry facts you've got to learn. Um, if they were aware that lots of questions are truly open, uh, I think it would be a very different situation. Well, I think that's enough to give you a flavor of this book, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. I'm a science major, and I was completely disillusioned with the way it was taught and the way it is founded on certain principles which are supposed to be strictly constant. And you taught us that science, when it moved away during the time of the Enlightenment, away from the church, has become even more dogmatic, perhaps, or equally dogmatic as the church. My question to you is, can we use certain positive aspects of science such as the empirical methods of research? Can we try to impose rationality on the paranormal? And is it possible that certain aspects of reality which are beyond what we know as classical physics today can be established with mystical experience or the paranormal? Well, first of all, I think we can investigate a lot of things rationally and scientifically that science doesn't at present investigate because of these taboos. I'm all in favor of reason and science as long as they're reasonable and scientific. And um, I think that uh, if we take a scientific and reasonable look at phenomena like telepathy, um, it turns out that they're not paranormal in the sense of beyond the normal, they're normal. Animals have them, they seem to be a normal means of communication among members of animal groups. Many dogs and cats and parrots and horses show uh, telepathic responses to their human owners. In the human realm, telepathy is common. Uh, more than 80% of people have had uh, telepathic experiences in relation to phone calls. So, first of all, I would say that whole realms of stuff that are present classified as paranormal are normal and perfectly investigatable using standard scientific methods and statistics. That's a lot of what I do myself. Um, I'm pro-science, not anti-science, and my book is pro-science, not anti-science. Um, so I think there's a large uh, range of phenomena that science has arbitrarily excluded on the grounds of dogma dogmatic narrowness that an expanded science could include in a larger paradigm, a larger model of reality. I think, however, there are certain things which perhaps can't ever be brought within a scientific purview of predictability. And one of them is the creative uh, impulse itself. Creativity seems to be inherent in the whole cosmos at every level, chemical, 
uh, molecular, biological, mental, social. Um, the whole universe in evolution uh, is an interplay, in my view, between habit and creativity. Habits lead to repetitions and the regularities of nature, which are very important, and without them we wouldn't be here. Uh, but the creativity, when new things happen, uh, it's literally unpredictable. If you could predict the next creative breakthrough in any subject, you would have made that breakthrough. Um, um, you can't predict creativity, and I think that's because there's an element of freedom in the whole evolutionary process, a creative freedom uh, which works through evolution, uh, which can't be pinned down by science. And I think there's an element of freedom in human nature, uh, however restricted it may seem sometimes, uh, which by definition can't be predicted. If something's truly free, it's unpredictable. Um, you can statistically predict uh, what uh, people will make in terms of free choices, roughly how many people will choose cornflakes as opposed to um, ricicles or something uh, in supermarket shelves. There are statistical predictions. Uh, but uh, for really important uh, free choices, I think that the, 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 there's an unpredictability. Just as there is at the quant quantum level with um, uh, quantum uncertainty. That may be chance, but it's still unpredictable. So I think that these are all realms where science, uh, there are realms science can expand into other realms which possibly it can't. And there are realms of theory, the expansion of theory to 11 dimensions in M theory or 10 in spring, string theory, um, are attempts to try and explain phenomena of nature in terms of highly complex mathematical theories. Whether these theories are going to be fruitful or not, I don't know. They haven't made any useful predictions so far. About 80% of theoretical physicists are engaged in what seemed to me sterile speculation. Um, but, um, you know, maybe they'll turn up something useful. That's an area I don't know enough about to form a valid judgment. Um, but your point about the potential expansion of science, the paranormal becoming normal, I think is a very important part, and it's already happening. An argument that I hear from a lot of scientific materialists is that by um, trying to complexify and nuance science, it leaves the door open to, for example, those who want to deny climate change or deny evolution to then say, well, science is really kind of uh, mistaken about a lot of things, so why can't they be wrong about these issues? And granted, of course, in evolution, a lot of the materialists will simplify the picture um, and, and give a mechanistic account of biology and so on, and that it's all random natural selection, and, and mm. that picture needs to be complexified. But how do you think about um, sort of the public education of science, especially in a country like America, where um, it, there's a large sector of the population that's actively denying many what would seem to be scientific facts? Well, there is no country like America. Um, <laughs> and... Um, there, the, this, this sort of anti-science movement, creationist movement and stuff, it, we simply don't, at least it hardly exists in Europe or in most other parts of the world. It's a peculiarly American phenomenon. Um, now, that doesn't mean it's not important. It's very important. Um, but I myself think that the best way is to be honest. And I don't think that there's any point in uh, trying to oppose religious fundamentalism by scientific fundamentalism. And what we've got at the moment is a kind of scientific fundamentalist like Richard Dawkins attacking creationists. The really interesting area of this discussion is not at those absurd extremes, but in the middle, in, in the area between, where there's whole new questions to develop and whole ways forward to go. So um, I myself don't... Uh, I mean, my argument is uh, the reason the book's title is different in, in America is because the American publishers thought that the science delusion would be mis uh, mistaken in America as being a creationist tract and uh, climate change denial and so on, which it's not. Uh, so science set free actually better expresses what the book's about. I think most people are quite capable of understanding there can be uncertainties. There's uncertainties in everything about the weather, the economic prospects, you know, one's health. Uh, everything's uncertain. Science has created an illusion of certainty, uh, which I think has done a great deal of harm, and it's one of the reasons that we have the science delusion. So uh, my own approach is to show that science can, in fact, investigate things that um, people haven't looked at before. For example, my research on dogs that know when their owners are coming home. 
I've had no problem with the religious right or creationists with any of my research. Um, most people on the right or the left um, are really interested in, does my dog really know when I'm coming home? Uh, and uh, this isn't a political issue. Um, and uh, it's a scientific one. And, and, you know, some people say, well, it's just routine, or they smell you. And then you can do experiments to find out, is it just routine? Can they just be smelly? And when I've talked about these things in popular newspapers and on popular television channels, uh, I find most people are truly curious. It doesn't arouse dogmatic responses, and people feel this is the kind of thing science should be doing. I think it is the kind of thing science should be doing. So I don't personally see this as a problem. I think what the problem is is that materialist science has been portrayed as the only kind of science, and materialist science is inherently atheistic. Um, materialism says the only reality is matter. There's no such thing as consciousness beyond brains. There's no such thing as God. God's nothing but an idea in human minds, and therefore nothing but an electrochemical pattern of activity in human brains, not out there. And I think this coming on strong with the, the atheists like Dawkins who've been putting forward this view of materialism inevitably antagonize anyone who's at all religious um, or has spiritual views and create a polarization which is completely unnecessary. Um, I mean, I'm both, I'd like to think, spiritual, religious and scientific and I personally don't experience a conflict. Um, and I don't think there's any reason other people should either unless... The only kind of science that's on the table is dogmatic, atheistic materialism. I think that's bound to create problems. So I think moving forward in a truly scientific way is the best way to go. And I, I don't personally find this creates problems. Good evening. Um, I'm curious about uh, your view or how your resonance theory might um, be reconciled with the theory of reincarnation. Um, I'm a big fan of the mind-only school of Buddhism, which, similar to what I was hearing tonight, purports that uh, the body and the physical realm is a function of mind rather than the mind being a function of the physical. Um, but in that model, um, that there isn't this notion of a collective unconscious. There's more notion that each of our minds are different streams um, going perhaps to the ocean, but um, I never was able to reconcile that with this notion of a collective unconscious, particularly. Mm. So I'm just curious your view on that divergent stream in regards to this and, and also just reincarnation in general. Mm. I've tried discussing some of these things with um, Buddhist scholars from different traditions, including the Tibetan. Um, and although they're, they're, they're very good on the subject of mind and the way the mind works as experienced through meditation, they're not usually very interested in bigger cosmological questions. The Buddha himself wasn't. You know, don't waste your time on these when you, could, you really need to concentrate on you know, clearing your own mind. Um, I don't, in, to, in terms of reincarnation, I, I personally think that reincarnation is an exception rather than the rule. The evidence suggests that some children can remember previous lives, and um, I accept that evidence. It seems convincing. Um, but then the question is, if they remember previous lives, does it prove they were that person, or does it mean they're just tapping into the memories of someone who's now dead? I think we all tap into the memories of millions of people who are now dead, um, sometimes people might tap into one more than all the others. You might have a transfer of memory. Uh, so then the question arises, is, the is a continuity of memory proof of personal identity, or isn't it? And then we get into whole realms of metaphysical discussion. I mean, the difference between Buddhist and Hindu philosophies on the whole in this matter is that Hindus would say there is a continuity um, and the Buddhist doctrine of an atta, as I understand it, is... Uh, one that says there's no sort of soul that moves from body to body. There's bundles of tendencies or memories. Um, so uh, it's not a simple question to answer. Um, but I think that uh, when we take into account the transfer of memory by morphic resonance, it does change the discussion about reincarnation and indeed about any discussion of survival. Even in, a, um, in other religious traditions, uh, like the Christian tradition, if memories are stored in the brain... Um, 
That's what most people think. And if the brain decays at death, which everyone agrees it does, then all memories would be wiped out at death. And no form of survival of any kind would be possible. That's why materialism is such a simple, straightforward uh, dogma, really. I, I, it rules out all religious theories of survival. Um, but if memories can survive the death of the body, they can be transferred to other people later, which would affect the reincarnation debate. They may also be able to survive in a non-physical uh, form. Uh, that's uh, t entirely speculative. If memories are stored in the brain, any theory of survival is closed. If they're not stored in the brain, the question is open, but it doesn't decide it one way or the other. So then, do you, do you view that memories and this, because I'm not familiar with your writings, that there's kind of like a collective mm, sort of, I mean, just as you were describing the, the waves in the air at, that, that our television set tunes into, yes. are you suggesting that, that, our, our, that consciousness is kind of this in, in this sort of all melted together and that, where, where do you get the Well, I'm suggesting we have access to a collective memory, a, a human collective memory, animals, rats can tune into a rat collective memory and so on. Hi, the last time I saw you speak was at Ions up on the hill. And you brought that fascinating um, video of the psychic parrot, the gray. Mm. And it was really quite impressive. And just as you were leaving, you said you were going to Philippines or somewhere to look into a young boy with his elephant that claimed the same thing, that the elephant could read his mind. And you pretty well proved that parrot could read the mind of that lady. Mm. Where is the parrot today, and what happened with the elephant? <laughs> Well, um, I went to South India to look at elephants and how telepathic they were with their mahouts. Um, I found that they, they were, there were some fairly convincing stories, but there wasn't any situation where I could uh, easily do experiments. I'm working with elephants is a little bit cumbersome. And, uh, and um, so uh, there's no uh, news flash on the elephants. Uh, as regards the parrot, Enkisi, um, Enkisi is still alive and well, and now aged about 14. African greys can live to 75, so he's still quite young. Um, his vocabulary continues to increase. He now has a vocabulary of about 1,500 words, which is the largest ever recorded for any animal of any species in history. Um, and he continues to speak in inventive sentences uh, uh, in an appropriate way. So um, Amy Morgana, whose parrot he is, is continuing to study him, and she's working away with the parrot. She hasn't published uh, any of her data yet. She's got vast amounts of data. Um, but I'm hoping sooner or later she will. And I'm, this is a very long-term project. Anyway, the parrot's alive and well, I'm pleased to say. Mm. Hi. Um, I'm just interested in... Uh this concept of the laws of nature changing um, and not being constant, and also how that intersects with your idea that mind and resonance sort of uh, contain the physical world in a way. Hmm. Um, so if those intersect, I'm interested in what you think about how the laws of nature and their change mirror our thinking um, and how those pattern uh, after each other and how they intersect. You mean the laws of nature in the non-human world, how they might be affected by the way we think? Yeah, um, yes. Well, there's a sense in which the laws of nature are human constructs. I mean, you don't actually go out into nature and find a law. Um, what, you, what we observe are regularities in nature, and um, I myself interpret them as habits. Many scientists would say they follow from eternal mathematical laws. Um, I would say that's just a way of thinking about them. One of the problems with modern science is that it's deeply anthropomorphic. It pretends not to be, but it is. Um, if you look in the natural world, where do you find laws? You don't. If you look in the human world, where do you find them? Well, not in tribal societies. They have customs. You find them in civilizations. It's the only place you find laws. And in the 17th century, the concept of laws of nature was directly metaphorical. God was the emperor of the universe, and he made up the laws that govern nature. And being all-powerful and omnipotent, um, uh, he acted as the universal law enforcement agency, making sure that everything obeyed them. 
Um, it's a terribly anthropomorphic concept. Uh, we don't find laws in nature. As C.S. Lewis once said, to say a stone falls to earth because it's obeying a law makes it a man and, ev uh, and even a citizen. Um, <laughs> it's, um, it's an anthropomorphic concept. Um, so what we do find in an evolving universe is it changing regularities of nature. And the sciences are in, in a kind of dialogue with the natural world through experiments and observation. Um, anyway, the best concept I can find to explain these is habits. And of course, we have habits too, but it's not just humans that have habits. Um, lots of animals have habits. Even crystals have habits. It's um, a, very, a very much wider metaphor than law, which is confined only to certain kinds of human society. Uh, on behalf of everyone here, thank you so much, Rupert. One more round of applause.